Today's guest is Grandmaster Wolf, mystic polymath with one of the greatest origin stories you are ever going to hear. It is unreal. Born in Australia, ends up in a hidden mystic school in the Himalayas, studies there for years and years. Soldiers come in, people are killed. It's absolutely wild. You're going to enjoy that. Meditation, manifestation, and learning how to tame your mind and work with your ego are central to the podcast today. We, of course, discuss lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences. We learn some of the secret practices that he was taught in order to develop the powers of the mind. We discuss Dion Fortune, Thomas Troward, and so, so much more. This podcast is filled with things for you to do in order to change your life. The first thing that people don't understand with meditation is meditation is the end result. Meditation isn't the practice. When you have trained yourself and got to the point where you can sit in the center of your mind and have the torrents of emotions and feelings and thoughts and all of the, the stuff that happens in people just to go on around inside your head that you sit there and you're not responding to it you're not jumping into your emotions you're not jumping into beliefs you're not jumping into any of that you're just absolutely still and at peace you're in what's called the original mind at that point that's reaching the state of meditation the years or the months or however long it takes you to get there that's not meditation. That's aiming towards meditation. This is the type of podcast that I love when we can get these experienced, disciplined teachers to break down and package their teachings into a small amount of time for us. Leave us a like, check out Rumble right down below. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you might listen to this. Check out our sponsors and we will see you guys later. Enjoy the podcast. John. Welcome back, everyone. We have the great GM, Grandmaster Wolf. Thanks for being here. How's it going? My pleasure. Well, it's, I'm doing really well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing very good. Life is life is good. Always seeing the, the positive side of things. Yeah. And uh, like I said, before we, before we got going, there's so many things I'm so curious to ask you about. But one of the first things I wanted to start off with for people who don't know you, you have such a fascinating backstory uh, for how you got started on this journey. Could you tell us that backstory as well as kind of who you are and what you're about now? Sure. How far back do you want to go? Childhood? Well, you just, yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I heard you once at least discuss what happened to you and that, that took you on leaving your home and it's okay. fascinating. Let's give you the short version. Okay. I had, I had quite a, an abusive upbringing. Everyone knows that. Uh, alcoholic father, abusive father. Um, he broke a few bones on me before I was nine years old with his boots. And obviously at that point, you start to think, you know, what's wrong here? What have I done? Is this my fault? Is, where, where is this coming from? Is this life? Does everyone live like this? I didn't know. But after a while, obviously, you start to talk to the kids at school. I wasn't one to hide these things at school, but for a while I thought everyone was living the same life, so I didn't say anything. After visiting a few friends at their homes and seeing their loving parents, hugging them when they got home from school and what have you, I started to realise that there was something a little bit wrong where I was. Anyway, one thing led to another, and uh, I eventually ended up meeting up with a kung fu teacher he came over from china and he was doing an exhibition and i guess i was quite rude i pushed my way to the front and i talked to him and he saw something in me that he wanted to work with and he called up I, at the age of 14 he called up my parents on the phone and he said, I've met your son and uh, I think we can do a lot with him. He has a lot of potential. Would you be interested in him coming to stay with me and my family and I will instruct him in Kung Fu and Chinese philosophy? And my parents said, sure, take him. So I never actually went home from that phone call. I just left with the, my Kung Fu teacher. Uh, no problem for my family, apparently. Um, and that was that. So I spent, a, his father, by the way, was a member of the Tong. He was uh, a hitman, I believe, 
from the Tong, the triads in China. And his father was excellent. He had iron palm, iron shirt. He was, you know, he's about 75 years old when I met him and he was rock hard. And that just blew me out of the water. Of course, at this point, Bruce Lee is on the screen. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, here we go. I've got my chance to be Bruce Lee. Uh, I spent a year or so with uh, him. The reason I brought the Tong guy up is, uh, which I find really interesting, you don't leave the triads, that you die, basically. But he was so well respected, they let him leave without killing him, but they did take his face off with acid. They threw acid in his face. He's got no face now, so he can't be linked to anybody. And he had this tiny little hole left where he could see through and that hole is what he taught me through and that's how i got to know him peeking through that hole after a short while he basically said i'm sorry little wolf is what they called me i'm sorry little wolf but you are broken on the inside and i'm i'm hitting a barrier so he gave me a, a, a letter of introduction put it in a silver tube handed me that bought a ticket and sent me to the Himalayas and I met a Sherpa in Nepal who was waiting for me and he took me up into the Himalayas in Tibet and dropped me off at the gate and I sat there for two weeks before they would answer and uh, a few passers by children would come by with leaves filled up with berries and they would just that, that's what I was eating while I was waiting and they just kept saying, wait, wait, don't leave, just wait. Two weeks later, the gate opened up and I thought I was going to have to sit there and say my piece and get my way in. But the gate opened up and this monk's arm just came out and grabbed me and pulled me in. I was only 14 years old and I was a scrawny little thing, so it was easy to do. I very quickly realized and found out that it wasn't a Buddhist monastery, believe it or not. It was a mystical monastery only, no religion involved, just the practices of mind control, enlightenment and all of those kinds of things, which was good. I don't know if my, my teacher put that in the, the letter of introduction or not, or if he organized it, but that's what eventually happened. So the magic was already working for me. I spent uh, 18 years there and we ended a few. Is this where you want to go, by the way? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> this is unreal. Uh, yeah. There needs to be a movie. Well, I, yeah, I think Brad Pitt did that one. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so where was I? Yeah, uh, a lot of people don't realize this in the West, but the original and still underlying spirituality in Tibet is extraterrestrial in nature. They have no problems knowing and understanding that their ancestors came from the sky and uh, they still think that they live there in the Himalayas somewhere inside a hollowed out mountain, but that's another story. So a bunch of us went to a meeting in Chok Hong, which is a, a huge monastery in Lhasa. And these were all mystical monks from different mystical monasteries from around the Himalayas. And we were there to talk about these old original teachings outside of religion, transmission of mind beyond the teachings, sometimes called. While we were there, we were attacked by a whole bunch of Chinese people dressed up as Tibetan policemen. And they murdered 12 people in front of us right there in the monastery. A handful of people, three of us from my monastery, was left alive. Um, they tried to hang me. They put a noose around my neck. They were throwing monks off the roof. I was on the roof. And they put a, a noose around my neck. And the guy was tying it off. And before he had time to tie it off, two soldiers or whatever they were threw me off the roof but it wasn't tied off. So I hit the ground and broke a couple of bones, but I wasn't hung and that was a good thing. So out of the three of us that was left, one of them was my teacher at the time, which was, he got me through that. So they took us and tortured us for about five days, trying to get us to denounce the Dalai Lama and denounce this and denounce that. And we didn't, of course. And then the British consulate came in and saved us 
So I went back to Australia and I took my, which is where I met my Kung Fu teacher. And I took my teacher with me from the Himalayas. And while we were sitting there in a place called Darwin, right at the very top of Australia, he was saying to me, you know, little wolf, if you have any anger in you from what's happened or revengeful thoughts or anything of that nature, you've wasted the whole 18 years that you've been studying with us. And I didn't have any of those feelings, but I wasn't sure. So once we'd convalesced, uh, we sent my teacher back to where he came from and I went to China and, jo <laughs> and joined a monastery there and learned Kung Fu. You know, it was called Dao Wuxin Monastery and it was in uh, the Hunan province uh, on a mountain called Leifa Mountain, which is a very mystical mountain. It's, it's quite famous in China. Most people over there have heard of it. Um, and that's it, really. So I learned all about mind and body and spirit in Tibet. And in China, I learned about Qigong and meridians and acupuncture and correct breathing, all of that kind of thing. And then I went back to Australia for a little while, opened up my own school, and then just traveled the world, not on my own volition, but it was just what happened. People wanted me to come here, wanted me to come there, and um, I just followed that. And that's it, really. That's all I've done. And here we are. Yeah. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and it's led you to this point. That is an unbelievable story, uh, truly. And, and within that, I mean, it's like... Uh, You've probably picked up the knowledge of a, of a million lifetimes uh, within that and so many different life lessons. And as I also said before we got started, one of the things that's really important to me is to always kind of look at, you know, great people who have done great things and been through extreme experiences and try and find out what I can take from such expertise uh, or such immersion in an experience, right? Because I, I don't know that I could have a life like that. And then a life like this and a life like this, it'd be amazing if we could grab all the juice out of it. And so, uh, a lot of those central tenets and things that you, uh, learned from mind control to meditation, still in the, uh, you know, keeping the mind quiet or taming the mind and things like this. I saw a discussion that you, or a lecture, I could even, even say that you had done on the difference and some of the nonsense that was out there on the difference between meditation, visualization, and contemplation. Mm. Uh, and I'm curious just for, because meditation we've had, for instance, we had Dean Raiden on, he's going to come back here in, in March. I know you, you had a discussion with him. Oh, we're recently. very close friends, and, actually. We're working together on a lot, okay. of, a lot of projects at the moment. He and I. Okay. Such a cool guy. Yeah, such a, yeah, such a cool him. guy. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you, you know, and, and I, I saw you guys discussing one of the cool things uh, about, meditation and, and, and Dean is what he's trying to do and to try to, to, in a sense, validate it for some of the people and just for science in, in general and all the things that, you know, you can do. Could you explain, because I don't think we'll have anyone better to come on and explain what is meditation, how to take it up as a, as a process and why? <sighs> okay. Let's go back to the beginning of your first question. There's about three questions there. Well, what is meditation? Meditation, the first thing that people don't understand with meditation is meditation is the end result. Meditation isn't the practice. When you have trained yourself and got to the point where you can sit in the center of your mind and have the torrents of emotions and feelings and thoughts and all of the, the stuff that happens in people, just to go on around inside your head that you sit there and you're not responding to it. You're not jumping into your emotions. You're not jumping into beliefs. You're not jumping into any of that. You're just absolutely still and at peace. You're in what's called the original mind at that point. That's reaching the state of meditation. The years or the months or however long it takes you to get there, that's not meditation. That's aiming towards meditation. So the difference between knowing that as opposed to thinking that you're meditating when you're sitting there practicing is most people think that they're meditating and they will just sit there 
thinking that they're meditating, even, you know, it still quietens the mind, it still quietens the heart, don't get me wrong, when you sit down and calm yourself and be, uh, what do they call it these days, being mindful. But that's not meditation. So most people will stop trying to go further because they already think they're meditating. Once you realize meditation is actually the end result, that's a whole different mindset and you will try harder, you will push further, you will go deeper. But if you think that sitting down and just stilling your mind there for a little while is meditation, you won't, you, you won't try and take it to its nth degree, basically. So that's one trap. Meditation, I get into trouble for this, but you know, already know what I'm going to say. People, when they tell you that you're going to go on a guided meditation, that's when you walk away straight away because they don't know what they're talking about. I shouldn't say that. Let me reiterate. They're using the wrong terminology. That should get me out of a little bit of trouble. They're using the wrong terminology. What I've just explained is meditation. You sit there and you don't move. You don't respond to things that are coming and going and trying to hurt you and, and tickle you and move you and all of these things inside. Anger, um, hatred, racism, all the things that makes life horrible for us. When you can sit there unmoving, you are in the state of meditation. Therefore, Guided meditation doesn't make sense. <laughs> it just doesn't. There's nothing to guide. It's a matter of being still. You can't guide someone to be still. That's silly. However, guided visualization is what people call guided meditation. Guided visualization is extraordinarily powerful in a different way. Your brain speaks in pictures. It doesn't understand grunts at all. The monkeys that we inhabit, they understand grunts because we've been grunting for millions of years at each other and at other things. But the brain doesn't understand the grunt. What I mean by that is you will have an intention to say something like, I love you. That's your intent. You want to express that to somebody. You already feel it in your intention before your brain turns it into a picture. Your brain can't understand invisible things. It has to put a picture around it to know what it is. So you think something, so you intend something, that intention arrives in the brain. The brain will turn that into a picture form. It will then turn the picture form. Another part of the brain will then turn that picture into an appropriate grunt. But your brain doesn't understand. What your brain is doing is, okay, there's the picture. The appropriate grunt is cup, we'll say. And it'll go cup. That's all it knows, how to turn pictures into grunts. It doesn't put those grunts into a sentence and it, it doesn't understand it. This is why you have people sitting there doing affirmations year in and year out and they're still sitting there 10 years later. They, they feel better, but whatever it is that they wanted to manifest isn't manifesting. If it does, it's coming from their pure intention. So the brain understands pictures. That's its language. And this is why visualization works and affirmations don't work as well. Are you familiar with a, there's a new thought author. His name was Thomas Troward. Ooh, rings a bell. Have you heard that name before? Okay. Well, he, I mean, you may have come across the, the name because he's influenced so many of the future uh, new thought movement uh, authors. And his uh, magnum opus, I believe, and you know what, I have his book and I can't, I can't quite remember. I think it was The Door Lectures is what it's called. Um, and in essence, if I could put his whole central theme on, he, he becomes remembered as the guy who helps to teach and influence the uh, people from The Secret, the, the movie The Secret, the book The Secret, and, and manifestation uh, for our uh, generation, let's say. And the central theme behind it, you just mentioned meditation brings you to that one mind, the original mind. And what was so important to his thesis was that your manifestation ability or your ability to uh, create what you want in the world was completely uh, correlated 
to your realization that you are the original mind or the one or, uh, you know, the central spirit, the all encompassing God, essentially. Do you, do you find that to be true? Uh, because it's been a theme on the channel to discuss manifestation in general, just for trying to improve people's lives and to get what they want. Uh, but I don't know how many people agree with that thesis. So that's my question. Do you, or do you find that necessary? No. Okay. Next question. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> that would have been, that would have been really gangster. Though. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there are two truths in life. There is relative truth and absolute truth. Relative truth is specific to matter only, including your body and your brain and your thought processes, all made of matter. Whatever you are in there that sits back and watches your thoughts and watches your chemical reactions, which are, we call emotions, and watches your body, whatever you are in there watching that, and I'm not talking about thinking, I'm talking about when you sit back and you watch your thoughts, in those thoughts is your opinions, your judgments, your beliefs, what you think is real and what's not real, um, how to act according to your thinking and your beliefs and what you think is real. That becomes your truth, but that's relative truth. It only applies to the physical body. Physics only apply to physical things. Obviously, it's in the name. Spirit, so that particular truth, I'm getting to your question. Any truths that you come up with by thought, any truths that are only relative to matter, including physics, will die when you die, because these are things you've made up inside your head. Absolute truth is of the spirit. Absolute truth is true whether you are there or not. It's true whether you were born or not. It was true before you were born. It was true while you're alive. And it's true after you've, you've left the physical realm. That's absolute truth. It doesn't change absolute truth. It is the essence that some people call God, but it's life. And that's non-physical. Life itself is non-physical and it expresses itself through matter, which is physical. So there's a truth for the matter, which has its own domain, its own, you see. Physics is a dimension. Physicality is a, a hard dimension. It's the one we're living in now. Spirit is not. So the truth that you will only realize and work with in the physical world has everything to do with form and matter and physics. I just said that several times, so I won't say it again. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at here, how can I clarify this? The truth that we know is when matter hits matter, this happens. When atomic particles come together, this happens. The, these are what we call truths of matter. The spiritual realm isn't made of matter, obviously. It doesn't decay. That part of you, when you are in that original mind, in your deep meditation, you have arrived at that part of you that isn't physical. Therefore, it doesn't decay. It doesn't get old. It doesn't age. It doesn't uh, get ill. It's there forever. That's the part of you that is immortal. How could I put this? These are what we call invisible aspects of being alive. What I mean by that is willpower. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't do. You can't break it. Uh, compassion, empathy, all of these things aren't physical. They are something other. These are faculties of the spiritual mind. Awareness, consciousness, not physical. And our brain, the little monkey brain that we inhabit, can't get its head around that because it is designed to quantify matter. It, it doesn't know how to quantify invisible things. It has no idea. And that's the problem with YouTube, obviously. So let's say 
you come up with a wonderful, beautiful knowing. You, have, you can't think of something you don't know. You have to know it before you can think it. If I ask you to think of a bicycle, if you don't know what a bicycle is, you, you, don't, you can't think it. You've got no picture for it. So when you want to say uh, you have a pure knowing of something, I love somebody, let's say. That's your knowing. You feel the love. Your, your brain will, before it can even deal with that, before you're even aware of that, your brain will turn it into a picture. Pure knowing can't be touched. It can't be changed. It can't be interfered with. It's pure, beautiful knowing. As soon as your brain turns it into a picture, now it's delineated. Now it can be interfered with, and your brain will. It can change the color of it. It can change the definition of it. it. It'll give it a definition, actually, and then it'll change the definition. Then it'll add a judgment or an opinion about it. Oh, I like that, or I don't like that. It's, you know, your 10th hand information away from the pure knowing now. So by the time your brain's finished ripping your knowing to shreds and presents it to you, and you become aware of your thought, you think you're talking absolute truth, but you're not. Your brain's ripped it to absolute shreds. It's now full of opinions and judgments and all sorts of things that your brain's added. And a lot of the time, if someone hasn't gone back far enough and watched the brain and the thought process doing this with everything that comes into it, what you think you think is real and then you'll go out and start teaching that on YouTube or in classes or in rooms and you'll write books about it. It's good stuff but it's not original and it's not pure and it's not immutable by any, re by any means. Today's sponsor is Elastic Perception. If you're watching this podcast, you're probably fascinated with stories of guys like Tom Campbell and Robert Monroe getting out of their bodies, astral projecting, and going to explore the entire universe. And if you've ever wanted to try and do something like this yourself, you're aware of how hard it is to find good content, which is why we have to thank today's sponsor, Elastic Perception. What Florentine and the guys at Elastic Perception have done is break down the entire process of astral projection into a way and format that you can follow from anywhere you are at. You're going to learn different methods. You're going to learn the understanding of these ancient teachings and practices. You're going to learn what this means to you right now, spiritually, how it can affect your life directly. Everything you've ever wanted to learn and do with an astral projection, you can find here in this course, and it's simple bite-sized format, and then on top of it, something I have never seen is that they can offer coaching with experts in this field for you to progress in your journey. Check out Elastic Perception. Link is right down below. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. There's always talk of how knowledge has been occult, occulted in, in, in the world. I'm curious for, for people that want to get started on stuff, on doing something, on learning something, is there an exercise? I guess let me make this a two-part question. It'll be very simple. What sort of exercises did you do at the mystical school in order to train yourself to understand these things that you understand? And what can we do ourselves now? Ooh, nice. The first thing we do is start watching. Let's say we're talking about you personally, Will. The first thing we do is start watching Will. What does Will do when he wakes up? What's the first things Will thinks about? Why does Will think about what he thinks about? Why does Will feel what he feels? Did he think something to feel what he's feeling? Did he feel something to think what he's thinking? Where are these thoughts coming from? Can you sit back, keep clear your mind and go one, two, three inside your head and see those thoughts appearing? Is that a possibility? You just start watching. And eventually, you get to a point where you have a deep, tacit understanding, not a thought process. You have a realization, what am I in here watching these thoughts? You don't say that. You don't think that. You'd have to jump back into the thoughts to think that. But you will watch your brain thinking that. At some point, you have to make that realization that you're in there watching all of this stuff. So the first thing is you, you train that observer that has atrophied since the day you were born. That's all you were. You're a beautiful, pristine, clean mind as a baby, aware of everything. Um, 
That's the original mind that nature produced. That's the mind that life produced. That's the real you. And to get back, and of course, by the time you're 10 years old, that's long, long in the background somewhere. Here's what happens, my friend. You get this beautiful little baby, pristine, clean, enlightened mind, the same mind that is in all things. It's not the same mind as yours. It's not the same mind that is in a worm. It's the same one. It's not the same as, it's the same one. And it's in all things. You got this beautiful, pristine, clean mind, and then parents and teachers and the people next door and siblings all start to put their opinions, their religions, their judgments, um, their laws, their rules, their beliefs. They stuff it into this little baby's head. This baby's not producing these things itself. Someone's stuffing it in there. And it grows an ego, grows a self. When you're about 10 years old, let's say you've got 50 million thoughts in there now that have been put in there by other people. It's not you. It's made up literally of 100,000 other people, television, radio, etc. So this becomes what we eventually think is us, this whole bunch of thoughts, just thinking, 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 thinking. And that beautiful, pristine, clean mind that you were born as is saturated with this stuff and it's lost, it's gone. You're not using it, so it's atrophy. People don't watch what they say. People don't watch what they're doing. People don't, you know this. People don't even think about what they're doing while they're doing it. How many people sit on the toilet thinking about whether or not they've opened their sphincter large enough to get the poo through? And no, you're sitting on the toilet thinking about work. Or you're sitting on the toilet thinking about a movie, whatever. How many times have you driven to work and you get there and you think, wow, I've just been talking to my friend the whole trip. I don't even remember driving here. Uh, you see what I mean? See, we don't watch what we're doing, so it atrophies. So now you are living the life as a, of, a, of a zombie made up of a million other people's thoughts. So this thing has no wisdom. It has no intellect, really. And it just goes out and does shit things. It does whatever it wants to do. And this is why the world is the way it is. It likes to fight, it likes to kill, it likes to rob, it likes to do this. I mean, it does, there's nice parts to it, but the nice parts aren't working in the world at the moment, and the world, as we know, is not a good place to be right now. So this thing made up of 100 million people is ruling your life. There's 8, million, 8 billion people on the, in the world right now, so there's 8 billion of zombies made up of other people's shit, is it any wonder none of these people know who they are? Because it's made up of all of this shit. So now you've got 8 billion people. 8 billion of these things, these zombies that we have to live with, invented our education system. Is it any wonder your education doesn't really prepare you for life? These things invented the law system. Is it any wonder the law system doesn't really seem very fair? These things invented religion. I don't need to go on. <laughs> so when you go back and when you reach that part of mind that watches this happening, you are free of that. And you are free of pain. You are free of problem. You are free of your own ego. And then you can start cutting things out, getting rid of all the horrible stuff. And eventually you'll come up with this tiny little handful of thoughts that you put there yourself by observation. So now the real original pure you that was born is back because you've been exercising it by watching and you don't have a head full of 100 million thoughts going in anymore of other people's crap. You just have the ones that you have kept that you produced from your own observations and experiences in life. And usually that's quite loving and quite good and quite nice and very rational always. So that's the first exercise. And that's enough for you to have a damn good, wonderful, lovely life. If you want to take it one step further, which we did, you can then start to kill the body, literally. You hit the vagus nerve, your heart and your lungs stop, you die. It took me uh, probably six months. We did it twice a week. We would die on purpose 
in order to see what's outside of the body. Is there anything after death? Blah, blah, blah. So you literally you start to study death, not other people dying death, because that's just theory and hearsay, watching someone else die. You've got to do it yourself, otherwise it's not real knowledge, it's, it's a belief. And you can do this. So you get knocked on the vagus nerve by your teacher, you die. First time you do it, maybe three or four minutes. Then you come back. After six months, you can get that up to about 20, 25 minutes. At that point, brain activity is gone as well now. And now you can explore death and what's happening, what's going to happen. You, you, it's, a, it's not a near-death experience. It's dead. You die. And then your teacher, he's sitting there next to you watching you. Your lips start to go a bit too blue. And then he'll sit you up and kickstart you. You come back to life, you take a deep breath, and then you write down your experience. And then you can go another step further. But those two, I wouldn't recommend you do this, by the way. I, I have to say this for legal reasons. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so when you come back, you have a whole different outlook. Yeah, on on life and what it is and your part in it and what it's all about on the spiritual side, on the non-physical side, and you can bring that back into your body. And then when you speak of these things, it seems to have a great, a great clarity to it. People will listen to you and they know you're not talking about belief. You're not talking about theory. Everything that I talk about, none of it is scientific theory. It's not theory of, or oh, this must be happening because we are this kind of creature. You can't talk about truth if it's based on theory. You can only talk about truth if it's actually happened to you. And you can only talk about your experiences. My experiences are what I've talked about now. My experiences and a lot of things I talk about comes from being dead on a regular basis. I must point out, though, that it's not all roses. Um, supposed to do it twice a week. We would die on a regular basis twice a week. But me and a few friends, other monks, would go out and do it ourselves at night time when everyone else was in bed. So we did it about five times a week. And that can damage your heart. We didn't know that at the time. Well, we might have been told, but we were young, you know. You know what young people are like. <laughs> so we did it a lot. So I've got a lot of uh, good knowledge from the dead realm. So that's the first two things you do. For your average person, just watching. Watch what you're doing. And eventually, and keep in mind, the whole point is to re-identify with whatever you are in there that's watching your thoughts. Very, very quickly, you start to realize that Every word you use in life, no, it doesn't matter. I won't go on. You just have great realizations very quickly. You realize that all the problems in the world comes from your thoughts, other people's thoughts. And I've said this a hundred times. Take six of the most evil people you could possibly imagine in the world, put them all in the same room together, get rid of their thought processes, take them all back to the original mind that they were when they were born as babies. And for those five minutes, those six people in that room would be the most loving, wonderful people you'd ever want to bump into because you've gotten rid of the crap that was making them assholes in the first place. They have to learn that shit from somewhere. It's someone else's stuff. It's how you're programmed. The worst thing you could ever say to a child is, oh, that's just your imagination. You just killed 50% of that child's power. And that's somewhere where I want to uh, take it. Let me see if I can do a little recap here as well. What you guys were doing, this, the first step is the same step that you would advise to an average person, which is to watch the mind, is to, to gain an understanding of the real you who's watching the thoughts and then not identify with those thoughts, which is the problem that we constantly have. This one... Well, that was probably my very first realization at a basic level of reading a meditation book and then watching, not myself at first, but actually other people and seeing that they identify with this thing. And then once they've identified with it, you basically, it's game over. You can't really shake them. It's very hard, yeah. Once you get the, 
it's very, you know, once they get out of it, then they can see, wow, that was stupid. Why did I think this was great? Or this person was so nice. You know, <laughs> and they get it right on the outside. Yeah. And so that was a wake up call to me. Uh, but so the process through the process of elimination, doing that would be first. And then next, my question is going to be around, I've had some, let's say experiences around lucid dreaming and out of body uh, experiences or astral projection as it sometimes is called. I've never been dead uh, or near dead as, the, as that's also uh, discussed. I've heard, and we've had other guests come on who have been, uh, let's say, uh, Olympic level uh, out of body explorers and things like this. Do you recommend the average person or people uh, take that sort of journey? Uh, do, you, do you see uh, any benefit to someone learning the art of lucid dreaming or the art of, uh, of OB? I, mean, I know this are all plays on consciousness and what the mind can do and whether or not uh, one can always enjoy most things. If, has a, if you have a level of detachment and balance, uh, you can take something in and gain something from it and then move on with where you, your, your journey should go. Do you see any benefit in uh, learning to lucid dream or OB? Did you guys discuss that? Is that related to what you were doing? And if it is, is there any path or thing that one could do to enhance that or go down that? Absolutely. Route? It's really easy too. Um, astral journeying okay. is not quite the same as lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is akin to remote viewing. It's on certain levels, in which case... You are focusing. <laughs> Remote viewing is not the same as astraling. Remote viewing, uh, which is akin, like I said, to uh, lucid dreaming. When you do remote viewing, you haven't left your body, you haven't left your brain, but what you are doing is focusing your mind in different coordinates of the universal mind that you are an integral part of. So a very easy but a bad example is if you put your whole mind into your toe right now, your whole mind now becomes aware of your big toe on whatever foot you're thinking about. So you can put your mind, you can feel, you press your big toe into the floor and you can feel the pressure, you can put your mind into the big toe. You haven't left your body or anything of that nature, you are just focused on different coordinates. Now the one mind is in all things. Scientifically now it's the evidence is overwhelming that the universe is alive, it's a living entity. Scientific fact, there is this thing now called the cosmic web where everything is connected. Scientific fact. Um, quantum entanglement is in all things, you are connected that way. The, the evidence is so overwhelming it has to be accepted as fact now. So remote viewing is purely removing the pinpoint focus of that mind out of the center of your brain and you're focusing it, I don't know, wherever, Japan or, or wherever it is you're focusing on and it will go there, not a problem. Astral journeying is dying. Uh, I'm just going to put new grunts around it, so I won't say that. Astral journeying is basically mm -hmm. you are getting out of your body spiritually. You are leaving your body, but you haven't detached. You are still attached to it. There's a, an umbilical cord that attaches you to your body. In which case, while you're astral journeying, if a dog jumps on your body in the bed, you, you'll come back straight away. Most people in the world, you've been laying on, on your couch watching TV on a Sunday afternoon and suddenly you go, Whoa! you know, that feeling and it's like back into your body. What happened? That was, you're just starting to move out. Your brain was lost in the movie or whatever it is you're watching and that will release you and then boom, you come back in because someone dropped a plate or someone moved in the lounge room. Astral journeying is taking that to a nth degree. So most, some of the best astral journeyers are people on death row. If, if, I don't know if they still have a death row, but they, they were some of the best because sitting in a room 24-7, a small room at that, knowing that one day you're going to be executed, 
You don't know what's going to happen after that. You don't know about death. You haven't done any of that stuff. It becomes so intense, your body will throw you out and you will have a, an astral experience. Um, and some of these people actually have enlightening experiences at the same time. Most monks that reach that stage aren't monks that are running around in a monastery with a bunch of other monks. Most of the monks that reach that stage are in isolation. Um, for that same reason. Now, how do you do it? Very, very easy. Getting back to the visualization, telling your brain what you want it to have. There's a very, very famous um, lady Kabbalist, and her name was Dion Fortune, and she pointed out way back in, I guess, the Crowley days, really. She pointed out that if you have something in your mind and you hold it there long enough, very quickly, you will have it in your hand. So you just focus on something long enough, it will manifest. Why? Because you're telling your brain in picture form, in its own language, what it is you want. And your brain can do that. It's a very powerful thing. This is why just these little shitty thoughts that people have will create war. That's powerful. Thoughts are, you know, it'll create murder. It'll create all sorts of horrible things. So by holding a bad thought, you will, you will produce that bad thought one way or another. By having a great thought, you will produce that great thought, manifest it one way or another. It will happen. The brain does that. And because no one is aware, no one's watching that, no one is pulling back from their evil thoughts. People get full of hatred. Look at the world today. There's kids committing suicide because of the horrible things people say to them online. You know, um, Hater, well, I think you call them haters and trolls and things like that, and it's just horrible. And this hatred that these trolls and haters are putting out there are actually killing our kids. It's disgusting. So you need to know the power of thought and the power of focusing on a thought will manifest everything you focus on, and it will do damage if you're not selecting your thoughts correctly and if you're not manifesting things out of a good heart and a loving mind, that's the problem of the world right now. One of the most important things that I have learned interviewing all of these high performance leaders is that clarity of mind is crucial to your success. And what good is clarity of mind without clarity of sound? Which is why today's podcast is sponsored by Rode. We across Golarami use exclusively Rode audio equipment in order to do all of our stuff. If you are an influencer, if you're just a person out there trying to make some good content for your stuff at home, wherever it is, Rode is by far the best audio partner we have ever had. We have been using their stuff for almost five years now. It has never let us down. Truly incredible company, especially with all of the other affordable things that you guys can get from them. Check out the link right down below and enjoy the rest of this podcast. I feel like at this point, I've almost said this on every podcast, but we do other, I, I'll interview some of the most well-known and uh, uh, most um, loved, famous, successful footballers in the world. And I will ask similar questions, uh, almost like I'm asking to you on what is it that is allowing you to do what you do and, and things like this. And the many of them, if not all of them, and I mean 95%, like it's, I've, I'm, I already know when I ask the question, what sort of answer I get, they will always come back to the mind. They'll say the difference between me and that guy over here who was better than me, uh, was my mentality, was my mind, was my ability to focus on my goal, was my ability to know I wanted to do this and not go out with the friends and drink that night and do this and do this. And they wanted to do that. some sort of focus, some sort of concentration. And I link it also to this weird intangible thing, kind of like you were saying with willpower and compassion and love. It's like you can't see these things, but we all know they exist. We all know what it feels like when we have a low willpower and how dumb the decisions and how easy it would be to make a, a, a poor decision. And I see personal power in these people. And, and I've, I've seen it in my own life while working on uh, willpower, focus, concentration, and all these things just in a, in a, in a minuscule way. Because right now in, in our world, you know how everybody wants everything automatically. And uh, we have like mindfulness, things like you say, and, and their requirement is only 
one minute or two minutes. And I'm by no means saying that that's bad. And that's a great starting point for everybody. But what happens, you know, when you commit that to be an important part, it, I feel such a, a strange, a strange, it, and it was a challenge for me as well. And I feel it's something that I've completely, I've turned, it's turned on my head where, uh, you, you would do a little bit of work on your brain and on your focus and on p- perhaps quieting the mind. We, we squeeze that into 10 minutes of the, and then I'll just do whatever. Then I just let my brain do whatever it wants for the rest of the day. To whereas I've slowly over the course of years figured out that that should be completely opposite and, uh, and not even opposite. You should be aiming for never attempting to necessarily lose yourself constantly in, Absolutely. in these thoughts that are right. And, and, and so, uh, I, I, I wanted to know, it leads me to my next question, which is also on some things that people will not believe is possible. Uh, things like telekinesis, uh, being, uh, telepathic, all these things that we have a hard time now as a society, even delving into scratching the surface. I think things are changing, but I know you've had some experiences with that. So could you talk about obviously what is possible on the upper limits of a well-trained mind and, uh, you know, well-disciplined practice, what, what happens, you know, what is consciousness? What is life like? What can you do in, in, you know, these sorts of things? Eventually on the nth degree of your meditation, you'll get to a point where you don't use your thought processes anymore. You live your life from pure knowing, not a single thought goes on. You, you may or may not believe this, but when I'm not engaged with talking to someone like yourself or some of my clients and students, I don't think at all. I don't, it, to me, it's a very low, gross thing to be doing. Uh, <laughs> it's funny to hear, that's all. When you know what you have to do next, why do you want to put it into a thought process? You, you don't have to do that. It's a habit to think you're knowing. So once you've spent enough time and you, re- you re-identify, you no longer identify with your thought process, you identify with this thing that you are in there observing it, this thing that takes knowing and allows the brain to turn it into a thought process, that is pure mind, that is pure spirit, that's what you are, is pure mind. So eventually you get, you just live from your knowing. People do it all already, people do it. They just have the habit of, they don't watch their knowing habitually, they watch the thought. And all you have to realize is you can't think of something you don't know, so why are you thinking it? You already know it. And once you get in touch with your knowing, when you meditate long enough and you, you see your knowing come in and get turned into a thought, you very quickly go, well, let, let's get rid of the middleman, the thought process, and just live from pure knowing. Now you're living from pure mind. Now we're talking enlightened living, for want of better words. Mm-hmm. At that point, you are limitless because you have just risen above relative truth you've risen above the monkey mind that we all inhabit you've risen above it so eventually you wake up in the morning you watch yourself wake up you watch your body wake up you'll see your thoughts over here somewhere going wanting to take over the world but you look at them hey how you doing monkey and then you get on and you just live from your pure knowing you don't think about anything you do and therefore it never goes wrong. Whatever it is you need will occur. Whatever it is you need to do will occur. And you do it from your pure knowing. If you watch yourself, you'll realize that you do this a lot already. But you're missing it because we haven't been taught at school to start watching these things habitually. At that point, as I said, it's limitless. You realize that as mind, you are in all things. And then you very, very quickly come to the conclusion, which is a bad word because conclusion implies thinking, but you come to the realization, let's say, that you are in every atom in the world. You are in quantum, you're in the quantum realm, you're in other dimensions. Wherever there is mind, there you are. And you are 
the universal mind. Therefore, you are in all things. Therefore, you are in that rock over there. You are in that pen over there. And if you can focus enough on the pen without a single thought that that's not you and that is separate from you, you have to realize that when there's no thought, there's no concept of separation. There's no concept of individuality. There's no concept of can't do that. There's none of this crap that holds you down. There are theories that that's done on purpose in your education. But anyway, that's another story. Once you have that realization that you are in all things and you are all things, then ESP and telekinesis is obviously inevitable to you. It's just a matter of how do you focus in that area of self that some people would call a cup. And then it's no different than doing this with your own finger. You don't think about that. You don't, you know that's you. So it's not a problem for you. I can talk to you and have a go to the toilet and drink a coffee and do this all day long. And it's not, you see, I don't have to think about it. Why? Because I just know that that's a part of my being right now as a human unit and I'm in there. So I can move it. And it's the same with a pen or anything else. ESP, you just focus. If you focus your mind where that person happens to be sitting over there, you're not doing anything different to focusing in this brain, but you focus in that brain and you have ESP occurring. One of the things I, quick story, have we got time? Yeah, yeah, please. Sure. Of course. Okay, we were sitting in a restaurant. Restaurant. We, we were having lunch in Nepal. We were on our way down uh, to see the Dalai Lama from Tibet. We were having some food, and I had been meditating for quite some years at that point and learning to just live my life from this knowing, watching my thoughts. My teacher at that point knew that we were traveling with knew exactly what state of mind I was in and a masterful teacher waits for certain moments in a student's mind and then knows just the right thing to say to push you through a doorway or a gate or out of your brain completely and he said um, what are you thinking right now and I had to step back and have a look so I didn't know I wasn't I wasn't looking I was listening and I just before I started to explain it he said before you explain that are there any thoughts in there that uh, don't sound like you and I thought oh I've never really looked at it like that so I'm looking at my thoughts and I'm, I'm looking yeah that's me I, yeah, I would think like that and then here come these other thoughts and I'm thinking where did that come from? I'm not thinking, I don't think like that. That's not me. Actually, that thought has an accent and it's not mine. Where's that one coming from? <laughs> and then he said, now look around you and watch, but don't stop thinking and don't stop watching your thoughts. So I looked around, I took about five minutes and there was a Chinese gentleman over in the corner over there and his lips were in sync with these thoughts that were going. And I'm thinking, oh, and I had the realization. So everyone is doing it. Everyone is doing ESP. You can hear other people's thoughts. Once again, though, no one watches them in their daytime. No one watches their thinking. Most people who think they are meditating have been taught wrongly are sitting down trying to stop their thoughts, which is the worst thing you can do in meditation. Why would you stop something that's not you? What, what's that going to do for you? Nothing. Ridiculous concept, but how many YouTubers out there are trying to do that? You, you, it's disgusting actually because these wrong teachers who are just trying to be special in the eyes of others, telling you all of this bullshit, it's going to waste your entire life because they've told you the wrong. I, yeah, I. Uh, you, you sound like me from the football angle. We have the similar, <laughs> the similar issue in the football world. <laughs> You know, we're, we're guys that aren't pros that haven't spent any time working on their, their stuff. We'll tell you how to train to be a professional yeah, yeah. footballer. And 
And you can see that, you know, that if you followed this, it, you would certainly waste years and years of your life not doing the right thing and not training the right thing. And that's not how it is actually, no. you know, and teams don't care about this. And so it, it's funny to see the parallels. One of the most important things you can do if you're trying to earn more money is learn new skills. Stacking skills is one of the greatest things you can do in order to bring value to yourself and the people around you, especially one like learning a new language. I bet most of you guys had no idea that I could speak nine languages and that we have a YouTube channel with almost 100,000 subscribers where I do exclusively just that. And we break down the method for exactly what an idiot guy like me has done in order to do this. It's not complex, it's not complicated, and most of you guys have probably used the traditional method, and the traditional method sucks. That's why you can't speak any Spanish after four years of going to high school and taking Spanish week in, week out. If you want to learn to speak a language the fastest, easiest, and most natural way, click the link right down below. Go learn any languages. We've got the method for you. Check it out. You just touched on some stuff that we as humans can do and that we all can do, but we're not being taught how to do it. Uh, there's one of the most interesting things and as well as one of the most popular things nowadays is, is I would say, hidden technology, not just from the ancients, but also potentially what is going on in the... Uh, in the black world, as they say, uh, deep, dark government teaching subjects or, you know, uh, their projects, excuse me. Have you ever run across or is it theoretically, does this make sense that there would be technologies that can mimic or do the things that you're talking about or could they enhance, you know, because I feel like that is where we're going. we have Elon Musk who's trying to essentially make telepathy a reality for us by plugging us into the internet. And, you know, and uh, that's what's out here for us. What is going on behind closed doors with unlimited budgets and things like this. Are there technologies that have the capabilities to do those things or to enhance that? So if I'm not a meditator at all, I put this thing on, I touch this thing and I can do it. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that's essentially, that's my first question. What is that possible? Or have you heard of this? Have you seen anything like this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how can I put it? What, what basically will happen there is you will turn everybody's head into a walkie-talkie that can, you see what I mean? So the brain becomes a walkie-talkie. If you thought that the walkie-talkie is the thing that's talking to you, if you thought the walkie-talkie is alive, you've got the wrong idea of what a walkie-talkie is. What you're listening to is someone else using another walkie-talkie, and that's what technology will do. But an, I've had this discussion literally last night with Dean Radin, Dr. Dean Radin. We speak a lot. Um, unless technology can instill empathy into a computer and intuition into a computer and compassion and love, love is a glue. What happens when you love someone? You can't stop touching them. You just want to hold them. You want to hug them. It's a glue. It holds things together. It holds people. It holds society together. But universal love holds planets together. It holds galaxies together. It's it's a glue of life. I don't. I'm not. Don't get me wrong. I'm not demeaning what love is. In fact, it, I'm embellishing on it because that's what, that's what it does. Unless Elon Musk can instill that into his computers, into his technology, you will definitely mimic ESP in the walkie-talkie sense. <laughs> You're hearing someone else thinking and they're way over there. How am I doing that? I'm doing that through a walkie-talkie. And if, you know, essentially that's what's going to happen. You're going to have these little things in your head. And yeah, so it will mimic it. But it's not ESP; it's something else. Uh huh. Uh huh. Hey, that's a great way of of doing it. I also one concern for me, uh, I guess I could say, just for humanity's basis, is whatever you don't use, you lose. Uh, that seems to be a natural principle. I have seen it everywhere: muscles, sports, language learning. And I, I, I wanted to now on books because you mentioned Dion Fortune who I don't think I've read. I know she's written uh, some stuff. Uh, but, uh, you'd meant so. <laughs> yeah, lots of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's written quite a bit. I feel like it's so, it's so varied in that, in that sense that I don't know where to yeah. start. But 
You, you mentioned today, and I'd also seen you mention transmission of mind. I have it. I, I download it because there's a you can you can quite you can find it, and um, it's a very it's one of those books that seems that you have to study. And so my question is, do you have any books in general? And I know you're, let's say, not self-taught, but you've you taught yourself through experience, and I know you would probably recommend experience first. Are there books or things for people who want to go down this path or maybe learn how to, whether they are looking to do something mystical or just to change their lives that you would recommend? The books that I could only recommend are the ones that aren't giving you knowledge. It, it's a book that gives you this, ooh, kind of a response. That's the books you're looking for. We're talking here about, say, a, a book on koans, for instance. You, do you, you know it? What's this? I'm sorry. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is, no. Simple one. You would know this already, honestly. What's the sound of one hand clapping? That's a koan. You never heard of that? <laughs> okay. No, no. Wow. no. That's a good one. So there's 1,700 koans, and there's several books that work with them. A koan is uh, something where rationally you will never get your head around it. Reasonably and logically you will never get your head around it because it's not written for the brain. It's written for something else. When you ask someone, this is very big in Japan, these kind of things, what's the sound of one hand clapping? You'll have people going like that. <laughs> you'll have, you know, yeah. it's, it's as simple as this. And if you do it, if you hit the, if you ask the question just at the right time, when the student's just in the right frame of mind, and you go, what's the sign, sign, sound, bleh, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Just at the right moment, if you say it just at the right time, the student will just lock up inside. And there's no answer to it. And they'll go, ooh, and they'll just sit back for a moment and they will experience the enlightened mind in the silence of the answer. There's 1,700 koans, one for everyone, flavor for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some beautiful ones. I use them a lot with students, but only at the right moment. Another good one, it's a trap. A koan is a trap. It, it, if you've been meditating long enough, a koan will get you to that point where you can sit back and you'll see your brain trying to nut something out. The realization that you are this thing in here suddenly watching your brain trying to nut something out, then there comes a realization again, oh, what am I in here watching that happen? With the koan, it'll put you in that position. A very, very, very good Zen practice is when you get a bunch of good meditators in a room and they're all facing the wall in a circle, deep in meditation and the master is walking behind them in a circle and he's got a big stick you might have seen this on documentaries just at the right time he can he can hear you thinking he can feel you thinking he's been doing this a long time and if you're just at the right point and the person is in such a meditation that he can realize that they are in the middle of their thoughts but not thinking the thoughts are there but the meditator is paying no attention and not responding to these thoughts, he'll hit you with this stick, bang, on the shoulder. And if he's done it just at the right time, you, inside your head, will see your ego go, what was that? And you'll go, oh. and for the first time ever, you'll see the thing that you're living with. You'll see the thing that you used to think was you. You'll see the thing that's been pretending to be you all this time, your ego, and you'll never, ever, ever go back into that creature again. And you will learn to train it. And you have to train it with love. You can't hate it. And that's another trap that a lot of people go down the road of. So what I mean by that is if you've got time, I'll give you a very good analogy. Mm. If you go out into the the wilderness and you catch yourself a wild horse that wild horse is going to hate your guts for quite some time you've just captured it you've taken it out of its environment it doesn't know what you are and it's a, a wonderful beast obviously 
you take it home, you put it in a kennel or whatever, you, a stable, and you have a, a um, an area where it can exercise and you can exercise it. A horse is a smart creature and after a while it will realise that life with this monkey isn't too bad. It, I get fed, it brushes my hair, um, I get cleaned, I don't have to lay in my own shit. This is a nice thing and it'll start to allow you to be with it. Now it'll start to trust you a little bit. Then after a while you become friends. After a little while longer, it'll let you sit on its back, maybe, you know, but through love, through patience, mm -hmm. through compassion, you slowly become good friends. Eventually, it will start to love you and you will love it. You've always loved it. And you'll start to work together. Eventually, it'll go, li the lightest touch with your, your knee, it will turn that way for you. The slightest touch of your other knee, it'll go that way. Eventually, if you've got the patience, you can train this horse to become an equestrian champion. And together, only together and only working as one, you can become a world equestrian champion with this horse. It's become your best friend. It moves when you want it to. It does what you want it to. And it has a wonderful life because of that. You are now one with your beast, and it's a wonderful thing. And this is how you train your ego. And you capture it, and you love it, you train it how to be, you train it how to have a better life, and that's called self-mastery. Uh, I want to end now, uh, which is going to seem like quite the transition. You mentioned way back at the beginning, <laughs> about the extraterrestrial nature of the origins of uh, being in Tibet. And I, I at least want to know uh, if that correlates with all of us here on the planet or how and what that story essentially is best you could sum it up to, to someone or someone who's hearing it for the first time or uh, wants to get a general feel for it. What is it exactly? Panspermia is the beginning. Panspermia is where, um, let's say, there's a planet with a civilization on the planet, life, whatever. There's a beautiful ocean like ours. Eventually, another planet smashes into it, or a big comet, meteorite, smashes into it, and boom, planet explodes. The ocean that was full of life on that planet snap freezes, pow! It's like 250 below zero out there or something like that. I don't know the numbers exactly, but it's bloody cold. So a big chunks of this ocean freezes, snap freezes, and it's got life in there. It's got uh, back to everything from bacteria to just DNA. It's, it's all in there. And that might, as a, a frozen ball, which might be two, five, two, twenty, fifty 20, 50 miles across, you now have a comet whizzing through space. If it goes past and it's got a bloody big long tail, you know, thousands of miles across this tail. If it goes past a planet that has the right conditions, oceans and everything else, that tail filters down, floats down onto that planet. And now there is the makings of life already together, genetically speaking, goes into the ocean. And bang, you have that. It's called panspermia. It's, it's common. Everybody, the scientific community knows about it quite well. And that's happening everywhere. Meteors, comets, all over the place. Life is just constantly being spread throughout the universe. The universe is saturated in life. It really is. So that's how it begins. That, that gives you your basic ingredients. That eventually starts to grow into things and it's going to, that life is going to become whatever it was on the planet it originated from. In our case, humanoid, bipedal, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's bipedal is a very, very uh, good design. It keeps the brain off the ground, so you're not getting gravel rash on your brain all the time. You can see over the over the tall grass, so you can see if you know this predator is coming. It's a good design, so it it'll be used a lot throughout the universe. So that's how that gets around. And then you have civilizations that are a billion years in front of us. Real quick example wasn't 
too long ago we were on horse and cart. What was what was that? A hundred years? Let's say one hundred and fifty years, just to cover it. We're on a horse and cart. One hundred and fifty years later, we're on the moon. We're on Mars. We've actually got stuff on every planet in our solar system right now, or except for the ones most people don't know about. If a civilization is a billion years in front of us, their technology is going to be something that a human today would never get its head around. It would be like trying to explain a television set to a bacteria. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So that's the beginning. Now, yeah. let's say one of those civilizations, look at us. We're going to other planets right now. We're looking for life on Mars. And what do we do if we do find life on Mars? In our infinite wisdom, we're going to interfere with it, aren't we? <laughs> we're going to play with it. We're going to see what we can do with it. And it's just the curiosity of life itself. The curiosity of life itself is in all creatures, obviously, because the life that is in a creature is the life that is full of curiosity about itself. So curiosity, exploration, all of these things is in all life. It's life is a curious thing. Life is self-exploratory. Life doesn't know what it is. If it did, it would go straight to the end result, but it doesn't. So it's unfolding life throughout the universe, and it's watching itself. So when you're meditating and you're watching yourself for the first time in your life, you're on the same page as life, and that's why it works. And that's why things stop going wrong when you start doing that, because you're actually allowing life to live through you with its curiosity. Anyway, getting back to it, in the Tibetan thing, we are told and shown and taught that there are five Earth-like planets in our solar system, but they are revolving on the outside of Pluto. So it's a big orbit, a huge orbit. And there's about five of them. I've been told by science that this year um, we, science will actually tell the world about these five planets. They're going to say, oh, we've just discovered these five planets, exoplanets, and they're actually in our solar system and they are Earth-like. That's where most of the UFOs are coming from that we see today. But I'm reluctant to talk about things I don't have evidence for. Okay. Of course. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's truly fascinating uh, just in general, because I think we're finally at a point where it's at least the subject is being breached. Uh, I mean, in my short span here on earth, I can already remember a time where it would be impossible. Number one, for this conversation to, to happen and, and, and two, for even to bring up the subject and it be treated with a respectful uh, intellectual answer. And so I feel that there's definitely something that is, we're leading towards a different change. Um, and uh, what that is and how, how it's going to work out is the, is the other really, really interesting question. But um, listen, I want to thank you, obviously, for taking the time to, to do this. It's been incredible. I have a million other questions. We'll have to do it some other time, maybe even in person if uh, uh, the schedules uh, align. But um, is there any place you want us to have uh, uh, send people? Obviously, we'll link to your website and things like that. Is there any place specifically, though, they should look for more from you? No. I don't know. No, not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I have a YouTube channel. I love it. Uh, my students put all sorts of things up there. I, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's mostly interviews yeah, yeah, and lectures and talks that I have with scientists and talks that I have with, uh, wow, lots of other people. I, I'm sorry, everybody, but I just can't think yeah. of who they are right now. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of great stuff. Oh, thank there. you. Yeah. So, yeah, um, maybe at the end of this, we put this under this video, there'll, there'll be a link to my YouTube channel. And from there, there will be a link to yeah. what's called the GMW website, which is put together by um, an agency that just puts my stuff out and looks after me. I do have students. I do talk to people. I have an online consultation. This is how I earn a living. I consult with scientists. I consult with businesses. I consult with um, um, people from the Swiss Cancer Research Institute. 
Um, but a lot of people, and that's my online consultation business, but a lot of people use that to ask me spiritual stuff. And that's fine, I don't mind at all. So if you, if you could find that link to that, you can make appointments and you get to talk to me for an hour or two hours, I think, at the outside. And you can talk about anything you want to talk about. You can ask anything you want to ask. And I'll, I will give you exercises and show you how to start on that path in a serious way. But keep in mind that my way is what's called the fast way. And I don't muck around with tradition and all of that crap. And to me, if you're going to do something, just do it. Jump in at the deep end and you'll be surprised what you can do. It's so true. So true. I agree with that. Uh, we will link then to everything, guys. Uh, once again, thanks a lot. Very intriguing. I know uh, people are going to have a lot of different questions and we'll get a lot of good comments from this. And uh, yeah, looking forward to doing it again sometime. Oh, yeah, let's do it. it. Actually, in about two or three weeks, I'm going to be in Germany and uh, I'll have about a week of doing absolutely nothing. So if you like, at that point, we can do another one of these if you've got the time. I, I love it. Done deal. Done deal. Done deal. All right, guys, we'll see you later. And uh, yeah, until next time.